When we look at animals, what makes them different? Fundamentally, they look different, they talk differently, they may walk differently, some may fly, some may swim, but fundamentally, when we boil it down, what is different about these beings that we think that we can use as resources, that we've objectified and reduced to live stock, stock on the shelves that just so happens to be alive, almost an inconvenience that they have to be alive in the first place. What is it that's so different about them? We say it's the circle of life, but is artificial insemination, farming, genetic modification, is that the circle of life? Is that natural? Is it preordained? What about the concept of a food chain? Now, food chains are incredibly important. They help maintain natural population sizes of animals, help maintain the ecology and food systems and ecosystems in which they exist. But what we do to animals does the opposite, as we've already heard. It destroys habitats. It destroys ecosystems. It destabilizes population size of animals. It's the leading cause of biodiversity loss. So what we do to animals has the opposite effect of a food chain. And so can we really cite our consumption of animals as being something that should be considered natural, normal? Is it acceptable just because it is normal? Is culture and tradition a good benchmark for how we should live our lives and what we consider to be acceptable? Let's look at other places around the world and see if that does hold up. In Newland, where they kill dogs at the Newland Dog Meat Festival, is that acceptable because it's cultural? Is it acceptable that fishermen off the coast of Taiji kill dolphins every single year because it's traditional? Is it acceptable that in the Faroe Islands, a small island off the coast of Denmark, is it acceptable that every single year they kill hundreds of pilot whales simply because it's a cultural practice? Really jarred me last year. The Winter Olympics were on in South Korea and some of the British public and media were calling on a boycott of the Winter Olympics. And I thought, blimey, this must be really interesting. Like, what's happening here? Like, what's going on that would call for such a boycott? And it turned out it's because South Korea has a dog meat trade. The British press in some areas and the British public in some areas were saying these athletes who have trained their entire lives to get to this point, who have worked day in, day out to get to this point should boycott. Because in South Korea, they have a dog meat farm, which means that they kill different animals, the ones that we feel comfortable killing. When some of the athletes were out there, they went to a dog meat farm and rescued some dogs, which was an incredibly noble thing to do. The British media said that they were heroes, animal rights activists and animal lovers. But they got back to where they were training with these rescued dogs and ate pigs and cows and sheep and chickens and turkeys and geese and fish and all the animals that we conventionally consume. Why is it that this is the normality of the world that we live in? Why is it that we allow culture and tradition to define how we live our lives? Let's look at that argument and apply it to a situation outside of a non-human animal centric position and say, what about how we treat each other? Is female genital mutilation a moral practice because it's cultural and traditional? Of course not. Is what happens in some countries around the world to other humans acceptable just because they're ingrained in cultural practices or even laws? Because does legality equal morality? Often people point to me and say, yes, but if it was so bad, it wouldn't be allowed to happen. If we actually unearthed that something illegal was happening in these farms, the RSPCA would step in. The trading standards would step in. The FSA, the Food Standards Agency, they would step in. There's no way they'd allow these things to happen. But does legality equal morality? And can legality be trusted when there's such huge vested interests at stake? Because whether we want to admit it or not, these industries hold so much power because they hold so much money. And because they have so much money, they can influence us to keep buying these products, which is why we see labels like free range plastered everywhere and high welfare and humane slaughter. And we walk into a supermarket and we see things like happy cows produce happy milk. These industries are allowed to get away with it. And we think about what does this actually mean, happy cows produce happy milk? Because when we boil it down and we say, is a cow happy when she's forcibly impregnated? Is the mother cow happy when her baby is taken away from her? Is she happy when her baby is taken to a solitary confinement pen? Is she happy when she's exploited for the milk that she produces for her child? Is she happy that when she is so exploited and depleted, she is loaded into a truck or trailer and taken to a slaughterhouse? And is she happy when the bolt gun is placed against her head and the knife pulled across her throat? Make no mistake, the industry will paint an idyllic picture of what farming looks like, but they will hide the insidious and insepid reality of what must happen for animals to be farmed. What about free range? We see it all the time on boxes of eggs and even on meat products as well. 
Now I was vegetarian for a while and even before I was vegetarian, I'd only ever buy free range eggs. And I'd go around the supermarket with my bacon and my steak and my free range eggs. And if I saw anyone with caged eggs, I'd look at them and think, what sort of person would buy caged eggs? How could you be so cruel to animals? Because we're sold this idea of freedom in these eggs. Because when we see the word free range, we put our ideals of freedom onto this box of eggs. And so freedom to us means living a life of peace, doing what we want to do, being with friends, family. Fundamentally, at least, it means living a life free from exploitation, harm, and suffering. That's what being free means to us, autonomy. So we say these, these hens must have lived a good life. They must have done what was natural to them. They must have had autonomy. But we also say they must have lived a life without suffering and exploitation and harm. But of course, we know that's not true. And so when we see these labels, we've got to understand that they're there to manipulate us and make us buy this product, make us consume this product. These industries have vested interests and so they have to sell us an ideal of farming that we want to buy into, that we will ardently defend and turn away when we see something that contradicts our values. Now within society, we all suffer from cognitive biases, these little almost flaws or vulnerabilities in our brain that sometimes get in the way of us thinking rationally about something. And one of these is called the ostrich effect, where when confronted with something that contradicts our values or the way that we want to live, we simply ignore it and bury our head in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist. Or we say, grass-fed animals are great for the environment because Alan Savory says so, ignoring all of the UN and the University of Oxford, the University of Cambridge and all these other studies that have come out to contradict someone that has absolutely no reputable science. Or we see what happens in farms because activists document it or because it's shown in the mainstream media on occasion, and we turn away and say, that's one bad egg, that's one bad farmer, that's one bad situation, but it doesn't reflect the industry as a whole. But at some point, we have to recognize that the choices that we make have a far greater impact than maybe we want to believe, and maybe that we even do perceive, but we have to understand they exist. And so when we go into a supermarket and we pick up a steak or a box of eggs, caged, free range, organic, whatever labels on there. We have to understand that that purchase cannot be justified simply by citing individualistic reasons like taste, or <coughs> sensory pleasure, or convenience, or culture, or personal choice. And we have to understand that as beings that have so much power in this world because it's undeniable that we have complete dominance on this planet, that dominance doesn't mean that we have the freedom to exploit, but instead means that we have the responsibility and obligation to safeguard we should view ourselves not as the top of the food chain, as we often like to say, but as stewards. Our job here is to maintain a planet not just for us, but for all animals to thrive, for all species, including plants, to thrive, to create a harmonious ecosystem and world that hopefully we can all live symbiotically in, potentially idealistic, potentially slightly utopian, but it's something we should strive for. And of course, we can never be perfect, but in the world that we live in, in Cambridge, in the UK, consuming plant-based foods is not challenging. It's about reshaping what's normal to us, reshaping habits, reshaping what we're used to, but it's easy. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel. When I started being vegan, I thought, I've got to eat quinoa and kale every day. That's what vegans do, right? Mm -hmm. I made a big mistake and I was eating all this kale and quinoa thinking, well, this is what vegans eat. I ain't feeling too good about it though. And then I realized actually I don't have to change so much about the way that I live. And I thought, well, what foods do I enjoy? I'm a big pasta fan, so spaghetti bolognese is like my number one, right? And I thought, well, this is pretty easy. I just take out the beef mince and put soy mince or lentils. And all of a sudden I've got the same dish, but it's entirely vegan. Put some vegan cheese or some nutritional yeast, you're done, right? Or mac and cheese or curries or even burgers. And you think, well, actually going vegan doesn't mean giving anything up except animal exploitation. Going vegan doesn't mean we have to really make any sacrifices in our life. In fact, we do the opposite. We stop sacrificing. We stop sacrificing those around us for an unnecessary reason. And now as what's rightfully been said, being vegan isn't simply enough. And we should also make a st distinction between something being vegan and something being ethical. And so we should also look at the origins of foods that we consume, what types of foods that we consume as well. But going plant-based is, I'm vegan. The whole lifestyle, including the clothes that we wear, is the single first step that we should make on that journey. It just so happens to be the biggest step that we can make as well. And then we can start looking more consciously at other aspects of our lives and how we have an impact on this planet of a living beings, human and non-human. But make that first step. Try it. See it. It's so much easier than we're led to believe. 
so much simpler than we're led to believe and we have nothing to lose from trying it. The best thing we can do for our planet, the best thing we can do for the animals and the best thing that we can do for ourselves as humans as well. And so the question that I'll leave you with, a few questions I'll leave you with, is how do we morally justify what we do to animals when we know the damage that it causes? We recognize them as being sentient individuals and we know that we can live without having to consume them. What moral justification can we use? What do we place higher value on? Our taste buds, our convenience, our habits and routines, or their lives, the life of an animal, but also the life of our planet and the biodiversity that exists within our planet for the habitats that are destroyed, for the emissions that increase global warming that leads to habitat erosion, soil erosion, water, droughts, conflicts. What do we place higher value on? A simple 15 minute meal that we forget about almost as soon as we've consumed. A simple meal that really means nothing to us apart from a means to an end for sustenance. A simple meal that we just move on. Or their lives, our future, future for our children, future for other non-human animals, indeed our own future as well. What's higher value to us? Thank you so much for listening.